So the objective here is to get a discussion, you know, hopefully you know, ask questions, but I'll also welcome comments and interchange among everyone. And uh, I'd like your thoughts. Customer satisfaction. When you leave, you feel better, if you will. How long will you feel better? Like how many times you end up back in for whatever kind of medical care is required to bring you back to some level of satisfaction? How in heaven's name are you going to measure that? Uh, I mean, it's, it's common to the service industry. You know, when you, when you acquire a service, does that, uh, are you happy with that service in some sense, whatever? But that's the part of well, it's interesting. I had an approach from a company in, uh, I think it's in Washington, but it could be in, in Oregon. And um, they have created a product under a National Institutes of Health grant in the United States, which is a special grant that I wasn't aware of, which uh, NIH will fund companies to create commercializable uh, new software. Very surprised. I didn't know, I never saw that. They created a package. Uh, they had some involvement in the consumer industry which will uh, automatically call a patient. And you can do it on the net or you can do it by voice response. So what you do is when the patient's in the hospital, uh, you say, we're going to be calling you tomorrow. And the system calls the patient up and they have complete customer satisfaction questions as well as guidance that they can give. And they just keep doing that. The system polls them every so often, once a month or whatever it is. And what they do is combine customer satisfaction with a kind of a telephone follow-up program. Now, we did telephone follow-up research back in the early 80s, and we found that telephone follow-up, in many instances, was better follow-up than in-clinic follow-up. Right, why? Well, we were in a cardiology area, cardiac, cardiac surgery. Well, it turned out that when you're really sick, uh, you, when you've had a bad heart problem, you may be in denial. So the really sick people say, oh, I'm not that bad, and they don't come into the clinic. You know, and if they're sick, they maybe can't drag themselves to the clinic. But if you call them, you get them. We learned instantly what our mortality was, and we were able to detect the people who were, and we didn't know that till that time, and we were able to detect the people who were actually uh, in problems and bring them in so we could <coughs> intervene. I, I, answer, my answer is combine it with clinical follow -up. Make it one process and do feedback at that moment when the patient's interacting with you, and they're doing it in the States in a number of instances, and they find it binds the patient to the organization, which is big in the United States competition, coming something here, and it also gets clinical information and a clinical value at the same time. So that's, that's what I'd suggest. I don't know, any other ideas or about how you measure specifically the question, how you measure patient satisfaction? Anybody done any work in that specific area? Other questions? John? We seem to be moving slowly but inexorably towards a two-tier health system where it's paid for uh, care or it comes under the, the government uh, funding. How do you see this affecting the commitment or the move towards um, improved health informatics? I, I was hoping that somebody would ask about, I have this line which is, I'm tired of hearing about the one-tiered system or the two-tiered system. I want to hear about the no more tiered system. <laughs> and you remember that commercial with the, the and it, it, the answer is, uh, I think privatization to a degree will actually improve this dramatically because it will put new money into the system. We've been talking to people who have got many ideas that could directly impact, particularly the dealing with the patient outside the health system itself while they're in follow-up or uh, even the prevention side. So move health care out to the patient, not just in the institutions. There's a huge commercial opportunity there. I think you're aware that the total spending on, on things like herbs and spices and so on that we take is huge compared to even the cost of the health system. You know, the, there's a huge commercial opportunity and people want to spend it. And the trick is to somehow do that, and I have no idea how to do that without damaging the value of this health system. I'm a US citizen, I've been through the problems in the United States where you don't have money, you know, and this is a, 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 a heaven compared to that. You know, none of you are deeply concerned about whether you can pay for your care for your father or sick mother or, or child or whatever it is, not, not deeply concerned generally. In the States, you live in fear. In fact, it's one of the primary negotiations in any salary uh, negotiation. So um, I, I, I think that the answer is that privatization will actually increase the amount of resources and stimulate this dramatically. Right now, we're using IT the way we 
as, as sort of a technology we limit in an attempt to control spending. It's a, a very artificial way to control spending of any system is to limit the access to the technology or to the system. And I think we've got a problem in that regard in the public system. Okay. John? Dominic, I was interested in your uh, earlier slides that seem to be linking aging and uh, health expenditures and then IT. Um, it's one of the things that, that's important up front is that, that there really is no relationship between population age structure and health expenditures. I mean, if you look at the international data, there's no relationship whatsoever. Um, but let's say there was. A, I was interested to know how you think IT is going to have an impact on health expenditures in, in older adults. I, I, I thought I saw you starting to try to build that case, but I don't think I, I saw how, how how that's going to affect the expenditures on, on older adults. No, I, I didn't build that case. Uh, my point is uh, strictly in the health system. Are you saying that the population bump that's moving out will not increase the cost of health care? Yes. You are? Yes, no relationship. All you need to do is look at data on GMP expenditures in health care, population age structures internationally, no relationship. Interesting. I'd like to see that because it's just the opposite one here. Yeah, well, uh, most of the premiers are dead wrong. <laughs> well, I don't, it's not based on the premiers. I mean, it's a yeah, I mean, I mean, if we, if we just take that out of the, the picture, though, I mean, the thing about a lot of the, the information technologies you were talking about, like MRIs and so on, they don't really have an impact probably on, on health of older adults because if you look at the frail elderly, there's other things that start to matter that aren't necessarily going to be based on high-end uh, diagnostic stuff. Uh, so I was wondering where, where you were going well, with that. Sort of what I, I, have, I, I can't give you a full answer to that, but I can tell you mm -hmm. what's, what people are looking at and you know, that I know yeah. about. One is uh, moving more of the care into the home, creating a home as a remote monitoring environment. Now, I don't mean you're wired up, but where, for example, uh, the system will uh, allow you to, to uh, capture daily or weekly or whatever you want right. key pieces of information. So you, you detect problems earlier. It could be the glucose. It could be other things. There are glucometers and uh, pulmonary function units. And you name it, there, somebody's got an instrument for it. That's one area is moving it out there. Uh, and the theory is that keeping them out of the hospital uh, reduces the, you know, the, the cost at that point. Yeah, although there's probably a, a point where cost effectiveness for home care is a trade-off with, with people having will require too many resources in the community and may in fact sometimes be more cost effective in... in uh, I wasn't building a case that we should focus IT on dealing with the uh, seniors. What I, my, my case is, is the health system is facing this tremendous pressure uh, from the, the, the aging population and maintaining that uh, health system in the future is going to be a challenge. It seems to be, I mean, maybe that's wrong, we have to look at that. The issue of uh, the relationship of IT, I've not looked at that. Mm -hmm. My concern is just to say that a system already stressed, which is reducing its capital expenditure, seeing other areas expand, I mean, we're going to see a further pressure on IT for the need we have for it, but without the ability to invest. I guess the other, only other one I could have quibbled a bit with was, was the, the quote that, that I'm not sure who you, who you took it from was the, the point that for no hospital can you measure outcomes all the time. I forget exactly how, how it was phrased. But that's not entirely true for all hospitals. I mean, for any chronic hospital in Ontario today, you can in fact measure um, the health status of patients, what they were like before, every four months during the stay, and what they were like leaving. With quite a bit of accuracy. So I think it's more about the acute care system that, that there's less. Well, the work, I think the work that you're doing has changed that. I mean, that's, that's as I said, there has been work done in that area, but it, it has been in the long term or chronic or whatever right. you want to call it. In the acute care institutions, uh, you know, which have a dominant cost, uh, that is not done. And I, I agree with you. I think your work is remarkable. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, there are human and organizational issues in that, as you're well aware. Uh, when we've assessed different environments, I mean, the people who have to complete that data are complain about it because they complete your data and then they have to enter it into another system and sometimes they have to write it down yet again. What we've done is doubled their work or tripled their work for the same fat value. Now, good news is they actually get something out of what's been introduced. But the bad news is when you've got people who are not happy with what they're doing, they may be giving you garbage. And we've had over and over again evidence of that in the health system. So, you know, uh, but no, your work is, is very important. What I'd like to see, and this was with Torrance and 
Uh, Gaffney at McMaster wanted to see was those things introduced into the acute care health system, but introduced in a way that they're collected as part of a single step process or one step per item process rather than you know, three or four or five times the same data and inconsistencies, extra effort, all of those things. Uh, there's another question over here. Ron. You seem to be saying that part of the difficulty, and I don't agree with you, part of the difficulty is in quantifying the benefits of applying the patient. Correct. And in industry, um, they bring it in because it's better to handle it with a computer than to try to handle it manually. Well, I keep hearing healthcare as a generic term and information technology as a generic term, but isn't it possible to take specific areas, like say obstetrics or sure. home care or something like that. And isn't it, I know of one case, I've met a, doc, a doctor <coughs> in the United States who runs the two obstetrics schools in Ireland. And they're totally computerized. But wouldn't it be possible to take a look at that on the one hand and then go look at something else in Omaha, Nebraska, that doesn't have a computer within 19 miles and compare the two systems? You, yeah, you might be able to do that. The problem would be that you'd have such differential implementations and investments in those two places that you really couldn't combine them. You know, so even the same system put into two different locations, they would probably be quite different systems generally. The way they're put together, the involvement of the staff, the, uh, the specific way they're implemented, set up, will, will be sufficiently different that you really don't quite, you don't have the same situation. It's different. So you could have a, an institution that's got product A, and they started out with 30 people handling paper, and they put in product A, and they reorganize everything. They have 10 people handling paper, and they use the rest of that money somehow productively in the system, but basically they've saved on that process. You have another place that puts in the system and has no effect. They, they have the 30 people even handling more paper. It's been pointed out that laboratory information systems in a lot of laboratories actually cause people more work than the original laboratory. Why? Well, the thing produces paper and they file it, for example, or they keep doing their logs of what's coming in and out on paper as well as on the computer. So the problem is that you'd have to go in and you'd have to have two similar implementations. Uh, you know, so you really have got the same thing you're dealing with. Sure, you could study multiple places. If you also study whether they were very different, maybe you could come up with, well, they're not that different and compare the two then. Our danger is we compare, well, apples and who knows what, you know, Bolts uh, sometimes things are so different. It's very difficult to compare what's there. But isn't part of the problem that, that it's just this twenty billion or eighty billion dollar a year industry, and people keep talking about that, and it can <coughs> start with something that's relatively small? No, I, I agree. In fact, there's a, a literature that says uh, forget the macroeconomic, forget the firm level across 700 companies or sectoral level, where <coughs> sectoral and firm, and you know, forget all that, and forget each study, the outcome of the entire IS in a hospital, look at an application. Yeah, there's a good argument for that. The problem then is uh, if you do this, you've got to do it, you've got to look at that application in a way that's consistent across the institutions, and has to be a similar intervention. So you can't give the equivalent of an aspirin here and an antibiotic there and expect to compare the results. So you've got to have a controlled situation of some kind. That's, that's one problem with it. Some hospitals do business cases. They say, the system's going to save us money and they can do an analysis. And I mentioned that, you know, which is the beginning of that, they don't go back at the end and measure if they saved the money. And if they do go back and measure it, they measure that they didn't save the money because they didn't make the changes. So if you do do such a study, it's got to be done in a controlled way with a valid methodology uh, you know, where you actually make sure that all the changes you said you were going to make occur. Why do the study? Why not, if there must be a circumstance where you can find uh, a unilateral decision that this is a good idea, do it. Well, and then, and yeah. then you've got something that's there that you can Pe People have been doing that. Way. People have been doing that. And I'm sure we've got people, a number of people from uh, MITRA here, for example. I mean, you go in, and I'm sure you're even, maybe you could comment to this, you're pressured to do return on investment analysis to introduce a picture archiving and communication system. And you do the analysis, you know, and you, at the end of the thing, uh, you know, do they, do they actually make all the changes? I and mean, you get sometimes your systems of effectiveness, I'm sure has been blamed on uh, not actually making the changes that they said they would make. I don't know, can you comment on this total problem? I've been talking to people that are trying to do the film series that we generate in the 
they try to what? Sorry, let me see. Yes, measure. They may look at a particular thing. You look at one particular right. The film costs a lot of money, a couple dollars per sheet of film. And, and you know, if you put a pack system in, picture archiving for me, you put the, that, that thing in, well, of course, it's going to be soft images, right? Well, you know, we're looking at screens, right? Well, if you do that, then you'll get a saving because, or a, it doesn't say it'll pay for the system, but you'll save your film costs. Well, there are other costs you could save. For example, you got people moving those films around in a film library. Well, put a pack system in, that should save our film library, right? Ah, nope, because you got a thousand years of films in the library that have to still be managed. You can't switch it over. And you have to produce some film because when things go to other hospitals that don't have a pack system, or to doctor's offices that don't have a pack system, they've got to be on film. So you have to then produce a film. So it's, it's a complicated environment, and people often look at just one or two things. But the, the, there's, I just read, one, I think it's the most recent study I've seen this year, last year, 2001, on PACs. And what it says is the typical predicted savings is over 10 years. Well, I think most of you realize that that's a really specious argument in 10 years, but I don't think it includes net present value. So, you know, they're talking about two system life cycles probably for one thing. And you, you've got to look at the studies. People are finding more and more that picture archiving and communication systems, if you fully implement them with good technology and make all the human changes that are required, new work processes and so on, can pay back the investment. Do they save you oodles and oodles of money? Well, maybe in certain circumstances where things were a real mess, but not instantaneously because you'll have to handle films for a period of time because of all the ones you took last year. Okay, so it, it isn't as easy as you think it is. It's, it's, a, it's a challenging problem. I've, I have probably read a hundred studies of picture archiving and communication systems, and it's still hard to point out good evidence that they save money. I don't think it necessarily should be the issue. Go ahead. Uh, maybe this is a bit of a naive comment, but what if it costs the same money but improved service? That's right. And, and what is improved service? Uh, we don't lose, for example, we don't lose films. How many films we lose in our large institutions? 10, 15 percent of films are lost. We had a fire in a cardiovascular unit in Toronto General. We found thousands of films in piles. We're wondering what they were. You know, they were just left there over the years. Somebody just kept putting them on a shelf. There's a stack of, you know, in fact, several stacks of films just sitting there. You know, so you lose films because people don't bring them back. You can at least track, well, you don't lose images for one thing, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's some significant things like that. Frank. The uh, discussion that you've been having here sounds so much like office information and office automation from the 60s yeah. and 70s that uh, it's scary. Um, the, uh, that argument isn't being made by most people anymore, uh, that whether or not a business should actually computerize their inventory, should computerize their... Um, uh, uh, order entry, the purchasing, the uh, sales records, communication with clients. And it's not because people studied it and decided that this was the right way to go. It's because repeatedly companies that eventually implement this started doing better um, or became sexier and therefore people invested or whatever the case might be. So it seems to me a problem in the health industry. I, I, I'm trying to think what makes health industry unique or different, and maybe you've got some, some arguments. One of them is certainly that it is public, not private. Um, but within the health industry, there are certainly private things, such as the labs that, that run their own businesses that compete with each other. That you, We could imagine that somebody like a, you know, NDS puts in an, an, an information system and all of a sudden goes out of business or all of a sudden takes everybody's business, which is the way it goes. Uh, uh, that kind of an experiment uh, will, will work. Now, of course, they're going to do many other things and, and, um, and it, it's not going to be just information technology, but you have argued that it shouldn't be just information technology. It's got to be lots of things together and, and the best practices will somehow uh, come to the fore. So I think I'm, I'm arguing or saying that this micro change on a small application, A, is the right way to go, and B, that within the health industry, surely there are some places where it is already happening or could be happening uh, in order to, to try to, to validate that it is a, a good thing to do. And then it, and it 
then it gets picked up by others once uh, success stories are, are seen. So yeah. You have that wonderful driver in business. It's called profitability. It makes a big difference. And if your IS, uh, CIO says to you, uh, you know, you should invest in intranet, and uh, the CIO is wrong, well, you fire him, her, whatever. And if the CIO is right, you invest more the next time when they... We have a problem in health that whatever is going on, the magnitude <coughs> of the investment is like taking half an aspirin for a headache. That's the problem. The fundamental magnitude, the CEO, COO, and CFO of our organization is not convinced like the office automation people became convinced. They weren't convinced that they had either. Well, somebody went into the investment. They won't release the investment. They will not make the, make the investment. I've heard, I, I just was you were talking, one of the, I was talking to a, a large Chicago hospital as a consultant that, where the CEO said that he basically gave the CIO 3% of his operating budget, wrapped him up in barbed wire and said, leave me alone. You know, and that's a, in an entrepreneurial environment. That was a public sort of level hospital. Not, not Cook County, but Cook County type hospital. Um, I've had... In Ontario, CEOs tell me, I think we should just rip all the stupid IT out and do without it. You know, they'd die if they did that. It would I go crazy. Like that was in the university, by the way. Sure. <laughs> well, in the university, I think a good reason. But my point is that, that there, whatever it is, it, the, uh, it's, it's got to be a belief systems problem because they don't really understand the technology or they don't believe in the results. The individual pieces of evidence are not good enough to convince them, so those single studies are not done well enough. They're not relevant enough. They're not that particular to their circumstance that they believe it. You know, so if you go through a business case exercise, it's sort of hand-waving. You know, a pro forma is a form of prevarication is one definition of it. And that's, that's what you, you think you're doing. There is not that conviction that this is one of the key inputs to a successful system. And I'm struggling with that everywhere. I, I, everywhere I go. So we've got people in jobs trying to be successful in their jobs, CIOs. And with working with CEOs who want to produce better patient outcomes, they don't understand that a key instrument is missing. And the level of information that they have is inadequate to, to survive. And the patients are going to die and not get well if they don't do something about it. They don't believe any of that stuff. And we've got vendors that are selling into that market, saturated with 25-year-old <laughs> systems that are 30 or 40 years out of date technologically, office automation ideas now that were there in the 60s, and they can't sell anything into this market. It's saturated with this junk because there's no level of investment. You know, so what do they do? They nuke each other. You know, a stupid vendor there and hope they go out of business and maybe they can replace them. The whole thing lacks any kind of evidence. How do you approach it? Well, I've given what I think are the approaches. Um, whether it's a series of very micro studies, which is very practical, or combine those into a, a two or three or five institutions that agree to work with you and, and you know, follow that guidance. And because there's evaluation done, trust it, and it's external evaluation, trust it. Maybe that's the solution. I don't know the solution, but the current situation is intolerable. I don't know. Go ahead. You're shaking your head no. Yeah, it's not. I, I don't believe the study is going to convince anybody okay. of anything. Um, it seems to me that it will be the, the, the ones that have the profit, perhaps, that, that do it. The whether, like, why isn't it being done in dental practices? Why isn't it being done in optometry practices? Uh, like, when we, we you get a large enough practice, maybe they're all too small. Maybe, you need, maybe they're, not, they're not big enough practices. Or in, in laboratories, health laboratories, places that saying that it's a government investment problem is, is, is not the problem. So I, it's, I, a, it's, a, it's a mentality. Absolutely. It's problem. not the, the government investment is not a problem. Why is there. So, office automation had the same problem. How did they get around it? And why is our companies, just because of in the health industry, broadly speaking, um, immune to those things? Well, the thing that has changed, it is shifting. And it, 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 it was a, f a friend of mine, Erica Drazen, who works now with First Consulting, very well published and known. She said uh, back in about 1995, wait till resistance changes to insistence when talking about physicians. The real change and the organizational orientation is to change the docs. Because if the docs say I can't function, now you're talking about the nature of care itself and quality, and that, that will shift it. So what we're seeing is more and more physicians trying to move into health informatics, but also we're seeing the physicians and institutions rising up, and instead of complaining about the few dollars they get for overtime in the ER on the weekend, they're saying, if we don't put a system in here, we're going to go public. 
You know, that, will, that will eventually change it. The docs know the problem they've got. And if all we have to do is get them through that diffusion of innovation cycle where they realize there's a solution and realize some of their peers are using that solution, and you know, then there'll be the conversion. And maybe that's where all the emphasis should be. But the problem, again, is that getting the dollars in these hospitals to do anything significant, uh, Rena had to go out from Cambridge to the government to get a grant to really do the, the order entry system thing properly. And she got the thinnest grant I can imagine. She did the least expensive order entry study in the history of health informatics. Any hospital in the United States would have asked $3 million for what she's doing. All right? But we're, we're all operating at a level that we're almost humble about this. And, you know, but you're right. Maybe that's the shift that needs to occur. I think we need to convince, though, people, if we could show docs that you, in fact, can improve patient outcomes, save lives, reduce medical errors, really show that, well, maybe they then push it to some limit. But the docs are then presented with this at budget committee. What do you want? The new MRI or the new system, IT system? And sometimes it goes MRI and sometimes it goes IT. There will be, a, at the bottom of the whole thing, an issue of budget, the total money. And the total money in the health system right now, despite everything the government says, I think it's got a problem. <coughs> Rina, you, since I've been picking on you in public, I mean... I, I was just going to make a comment that I, I think some of the things have changed that will probably change not only physician opinion but also public opinion. And we think... Um, Justice declared that health services restructuring took problems uh, through the entire restructuring, and the penny kind of dropped at the end that one of the problems was IT and making some kind of an investment in IT and the patient record to make that work for patients. And I think we've seen that in the Postman's report, we've seen it in the OHA, the building for um, health for Ontario, that report. And also we had coming out of the states that the big report of air is human that has really, I think, focused attention on the fact that we really have to do something with information technology to make it safer for patients. And none of these people are really focusing on the fact that it's going to save money. But it, I mean, it, I think it will okay. save um, lives due to, that have been otherwise lost due to medical error, which is huge. Mm -hmm. We don't have very good statistics here. That's why I believe we have to. That's why I believe we have to emphasize outcomes. That the economic, the cost thing is not really the true issue. Cost is an issue, but it's not the, the fundamental issue. And, but again, that's that's very problematic, and we're not doing it in our, particularly in the big area of expenditure, the acute system. Um, you know, yeah, you're right on. So I think that will have an effect. Other comments. Anybody else? Okay. How much feedback do you get from the staff who use it about the system that the, you've now implemented? Uh, how much flack? No, constructive criticism. Uh, first of all, it's more flack by, by definition of, of anti-aircraft fire than it is constructive criticism. Staff have been reamed by systems in many institutions. And uh, the, um, the, the failure, the human organizational issue is what the problem is. People are professionals, and their work is kind of not is not taken into account. Their style of work, their um, uh, feeling about their work, uh, the, the things that they like doing versus don't like doing aren't taken into account. So when you impose a system, it's often a total imposition of a new work style and maybe even a new way of thinking, which may or may not be positive. Uh, one hospital in Ontario, a very large hospital, introduced a nursing information system tried to force it down the nurses' throats. This is a really large hospital. And they ended up uh, having to pull it out because the nurses refused. The way that that thing drove nursing was different from the way the nurses worked. They called it a nursing model. And it was a different nursing model. And it just didn't fit. But it took a long time and a lot of grief. Alberta, uh, back in, I might say, about the late 80s, had a system it put in at, uh, I think it was Holy Cross, but it might have been Foothills. No, it was Foothills where all the residents rose up and said, we won't use it. You know, this is awful. It, it took them three times longer to make a laboratory order with that system. And it's recognized as one of the best systems. They weren't really counseled in this, and the residents do that kind of work, scut work it's called, for everybody else. You say, well, that was in the 1980s. I was just doing a consultation last spring in Arizona, and the same thing happened to that same company with its new product. 
the physicians ran it out of the hospital and the guy whom I know very well was forced to start all over again, this time involving the physicians instead of forcing it down their gullets. We, you know, I don't know what to say, but the technology is not being, not, not only not being effective, but one of the reasons maybe that it's not effective is that it's not being properly integrated with people's practices and they're not being given an opportunity uh, to participate in the decision making. The rest was all. <laughs> I was just sitting there thinking that some of the discussion is talking about IT like a magic wand, once away it cures all things. Right. Uh, it obviously isn't because you can identify and define successes and failures. So it is all those human things. But more importantly, I think, is that any project needs clear objectives. Then it needs buy in from all those yeah. people you mentioned. And the phrase that got me is trying to ram it down the position's throat. I think if you talk to a 20 project managers and say, we're going to try to ram this project down our end users' throats. What do you think our chances of success are? They can save you a lot of money and a lot of grief quite quickly. And I think we too often overlook the bad judgment aspects of this. And then just look at the IT side and go, oh, wow, that technology wasn't robust enough for it. You know, we also had the wrong educators involved here. When in fact, it was just a bad idea from the beginning. Had we done a little bit more upfront vetting of whether this thing had a chance of success, we probably could have all saved a mm -hmm. tremendous amount of blood. Interestingly enough, uh, where I mentioned this uh, system failing was on the area of order entry. And uh, that person had gotten a mandate from the institution to literally be able to ram it down everybody's throat. And what he found when he faced this is it didn't work. It, you know, it was amazing you know, that it's still going on. And no one's suggesting that the institution reflects all of its stakeholders' interests. No. So it might have been a great investment decision. Right. Yet from a physician point of view, they'd say, you don't have time. Right, that's true. that's true. I wish I had a better answer to Frank's question about, you know, is, is this something unique about healthcare? Um, I, don't, I think one of the aspects of healthcare is that uh, the professions have always been very independent. You know, nurses do nursing, physicians do physicianing, and uh, doctoring as you choose. And uh, they really consider themselves to be full professionals. I think if you had the same thing, if you tried to change the way lawyers did things, you might have some similar trouble, or engineers. Uh, in, in, those, in some of those professions, like uh, in the legal profession, computing has been very slow to diffuse. It's, it's been relatively late. That's a very knowledge industry. Uh, the system at first were difficult to use. They didn't have many information resources. And so you get a critical mass of information, it isn't really worthwhile. You know, so there are some differences with regard to the people that are involved. In the offices, the secretary came in, didn't want to do it. Well, he or she would be fired. You, know, you don't do that to healthcare workers and survive. It just isn't going to happen that way. The organizations are, are a lot more changeable, aren't quite such, uh, so professionally, uh, so many professionals in them and not quite so many different kinds of professionals that have their own TERPs, their own professional standards, and their own pride, and those kinds of things. So it's usually upper management and the office automation. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Healthcare is, is, is I was saying, it's the worst case, and it's the perfect case for problems because all the factors are always there. And that may be one of the big differences. You don't change. I've watched department meetings in computer science. You know, just change everybody. It, you know, you're not going to do it. You know, it's hard to get them to sit in the front of the room or not behind the wall so they can't see it. You know, so it's a, uh, when you get to the other professions, if we have four kinds of professionals or six kinds of professionals, I think it would be even that much more difficult. The answer may be there. Uh, some of you must have thought of this before. Yes? Well, I think one of the other fundamental differences between healthcare and other industries is the fact that healthcare competes for resources, they don't compete for patients. Whereas other industries compete. Good point. Their competition is more to get patients to get clients and so on. How do you think that influences what happens within healthcare? Well, I think that the IT budgets are um, somewhat geared towards um, putting it more to the patient's needs and the demand that they can't meet already. And so they have to be the more that they can get to the patient. They may know what they want, what they should do, but it's not necessarily. I think there's another difference, by the way. I'll, I'll, I think most in the, in the uh, Senior management team of our institutions, people have not yet become what I'll call data-driven managers or information-driven managers. It's a lot of seat of the pants. 
not very long ago, about five, six years ago, once one CEO at a hospital, when we tried to introduce an executive information system, and all the vice presidents agreeing to it, he said to me, the last thing that will happen in this institution will be an executive information system. I want my executives to be able to make decisions on their own. If they can't do that, I don't want them here. That's a, that's a funny attitude in a complex environment. It's like a nuclear reactor saying, well, you know, it, it, we're, we're running complex organizations. And that goes even worse as you go down the chain of command to the management level. So the lack of uh, information-driven, data-driven management where people use numbers instead of flying by the seat of their pants, that's a big problem. And a lot of the people in uh, positions, management positions in our healthcare organizations came up through the ranks. They're not necessarily trained managers. You know, it, it's, a, it's very much that kind of environment. So, but it, you've asked an interesting question. I don't think we've answered it fully, uh, but I, I hope we've touched it. Just one other observation. People don't like to change. And because you're a scarcity of people within the medical profession, they don't have to change. You got it. That's another point. Yeah, we, we are a shortage of everything. And uh, I don't know if you know it, but you're not going to be able to get a baby born or a, an x-ray in a few years. Uh, we have a situation in, in, in British Columbia where it's getting to crisis proportions. I will, my wife does radiology, uh, uh, what do you call it, locums. And she, she can work anywhere. I mean, she has to cut it off after a while. It's crazy. So it's, um, there's a huge shortage building up. Uh, I, have, I have another slide with that on it that I took out. Uh, but that shortage is really a crisis. And one of the articles uh, that I reviewed said that one of the answers to the shortage might be to increase the productivity of professionals. And it, I, there, there's no, again, no evidence that that works, but it is certainly an objective. Uh, Frank wants more on that. Certainly the, the cost that you were talking about before um, must also be a factor, as you were saying. Uh, what, what dawned on me is you, you said uh, you want an MRI machine or a computer system. Right. For the first MRI machine, it certainly is the MRI machine. For the second one, it's probably the MRI machine. It's only when you get to about the sixth one in the hospital that you start saying, well, maybe now it's time to put some investment into the, into the, uh, into the computer system. If you went to a manufacturing plant and said, do you want to have an automobile manu manufacturing robot or do you want to have a computer system, it's going to be the automobile manufacturing robot first. And then it's only about the sixth time you say, okay, now I can do order entry. If I could just say, in this country, we're talking about the number of MRIs in a whole region equaling the number in one hospital. I mean, that is enormous. And it's not important until your knee starts failing or your hip starts going and you wait a year, you know, to get your, get your MRI done. Sure. Then it becomes a real problem. Uh, there was some... Is, if you turn the thing around and the government powers of fear or whatever say, okay, do what you have to do. Here's the money. Do you have a solution? You know, the truth is, no, it would, I, I, that's a problem that we need to bring people together on. I don't know, Rena. We, we know what the environment is here. Most of the systems in Ontario are either Meditech or HBOC and a few others. Okay? Meditech is a very basic system. It, it's, it's good, but not fantastic. And HBOC is a very complex system that's got its own problem. Is there a really great system there? No. So there always is going to be a compromise there. The, the, my point is that whichever system you would choose would work a lot better with a lot more effect on the outcome, I believe, if it were done properly. What we're doing... Oh, for example, get people to actually use it so that it becomes part of their work instead of documenting things on paper and then writing it later in the computer where it doesn't get in or you make an error at 5 o'clock at night. That's one example. They're not integrating it into their work processes. Do it so that the laboratory really functions on the computer instead of having people doing things on paper and entering it to the computer. We're in a, a 1950s attitude to data entry. We're not using systems to do things. We're using systems to document things we do. And you can't do that. You have to integrate. And maybe in education, which I think it is, a training issue too. But education is, is very rare in our institutions about IT. Where we teach people a new model of thinking. No, they're lucky if they get really well trained on how to use the system. If doctors are key to it, then shouldn't your focus be on medical schools? That's why we did, we, meaning University of Waterloo, participated in and led the development of a curriculum for people in medical and nursing and other allied health areas, developed a curriculum of health informatics to be taught in the education. Yes. And that effect, as it comes out in 10 years, if that's implemented, sure. 
uh, we're talking about what we're going to do in the next decade or two. And it'll get better and better, I think. But right now, we're, I think, in a bit of a crisis. Thank you very much. Just, I don't even know where to start to thank Dominic. He's actually thrown out a whole bunch of ideas, suggested some possible solutions to them. Uh, I'm just going to try and stay well. <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, when I see, actually, you know, you can observe many of the things that Dominic's talking about on a day-to-day -day basis in almost any medical facility you can be. Uh, <coughs> thank you very, very much for stimulating some thoughts. I, I've learned a lot of things, a lot of other ways of looking at the problem that I've kind of stood on the periphery of for a while. And we'd like to give you this small token of appreciation. I didn't expect to get a present. Thank you. <laughs> It's not really good. Oh, <laughs> I have to give it back. Well, thank you all for coming today, and we'll see you hopefully in February. Bye.